Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'll be chatting with Philip Ball. I think of Philip this way. I mean, we've had over 200 guests, Conversations with Tyler, and I think three of them so far have shown they are able to answer any question I might plausibly throw their way. Philip, I believe, is number four. He is a scientist with degrees in chemistry and physics. He's written about 30 books on different sciences. Both he and I have lost count. He was an editor at Nature for about 20 years. His books cover such diverse topics as chemistry, physics, the history of experiments, social science, color, the elements, water, water in China, Chartres Cathedral, music, and more. But most notably, he has a new book out this year, a major work called How Life Works, A User's Guide to the New Biology. Philip, welcome. Thank you, Tyler. Lovely to be here. What is the situation in history where scientists have most effectively stood up to power? Not counting Jewish scientists, say, leaving Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Gosh, now there's a, there's a question to start with where they have most effectively stood up to power. You know, um, this is a question that I looked at in a, a, a book, it must be about 10 years old now, which looked at the response of German physicists during the Nazi era to that regime. And I'm afraid the response, my conclusion was, the response was really not very impressive at all. That, uh, you know, on the whole, the, the scientists acquiesced to what the regime wanted them to do, even if they weren't. I mean, very few of them were uh, actively uh, sympathetic to the Nazi party, but they mounted no real effective opposition whatsoever. And I'm afraid that looking at that as a, uh, a, as a case uh, study, really, really, made me realize that it's actually very hard to find any time in history where scientists have actively mounted an effective opposition to that kind of imposition of uh, some kind of ideology or political power or whatever. So uh, it's, it, history doesn't give us a very encouraging uh, view of that. Um, I think, you know, that said, um, I think it, it, it's fair to say science is doing better these days. Um, there's a, I think there's a recognition that at an institutional level, science needs to be able to mobilize its resources when it's threatened in this way. And I think we're starting to see that certainly with climate change, um, which, you know, scientists have come under fire a huge amount um, in that arena. And I think there's there's more sort of institutional uh, understanding of, of what to do about that. Scientists aren't being so much left to their own devices to cope as best they can individually. But I still think that there's a, 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 there, there's this attitude, I think, that is still somewhat prevalent within science, that it's a bit like we're above that. This is exactly what some of the German physicists, particularly Werner Heisenberg, said um, during the, the Nazi regime, that science is somehow operating in a purer sphere um, and that it's you know removed from all the nastiness and the dirtiness that goes on in the political arena. I think that that attitude hasn't gone completely, but I think it needs to go. I think scientists need to get real, really, about the fact that they are working within a social and political context that they have to be able to work with and to be able to, when the occasion demands it, to take some control of and not simply to be pushed around by. And that, I think, is something that can only happen when, there's an in, when there are institutional structures to allow it to happen so that scientists are not left to their own individual devices and their own individual sense of morality to do something about it. So I'm hoping that science will do better in the future than it's done in the past. Which do you think are the power structures today that current scientists, say in the Anglo world, are most enthralled to? So you well, wouldn't say it's the fossil fuel companies, right? So I absolutely climate change, wouldn't. many people have yeah, spoken yeah. up, but on what issues is there still this problem? Where are the biggest biases now? Well, uh, there's there's Absolutely, there, there, there are uh, questions being asked and concerning uh, um, situations arising with the relationship between um, bet between science and what you might call commerce, really, between uh, and industry. So, particularly, for example, in drug development in pharmaceutical companies, there have been instances where it seems like the science has been either knowingly or unconsciously distorted by the commercial interests involved. You know, it's very clear that that 
certainly pharmaceutical companies themselves tend to under-report um, uh, any any work that seems to conflict with what the you know the message they want to put out uh, if they're developing a drug. Um, so there's under-reporting of negative effects or of null effects. Um, so I think that the, the, this the, the conflict between scientific research and the commercial interests relating to it is one area where there there, there are real problems uh, to be solved um, and questions to be asked. But I think that there's also now an increasing problem simply within the the, the structures of academia itself. Um, I think this is the thing that perhaps worries me most about uh, the way science is being steered or pushed these days, that there are these tremendous pressures, absolutely unrealistic pressures on scientists and particularly young scientists starting their careers to publish as much as they can um, and to, uh, uh, you know, to, to uh, I, I, I commonly hear the complaint from young scientists that they have no time to think anymore. You've just got to do. You've just got to put work out there. And it has led um, in recent times to some quite hope, high profile cases of scientific misconduct where results have been basically data has just been invented to, you know, to 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 uh, create a publishable publishable piece of work. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and I think that even when that's not quite so uh, obviously fraudulent, I think there's there, there are strong pressures on scientists to find the results that they are hoping to find. So there's a, a strong uh, pressure for cognitive biases to creep in. Um, so uh, th- this is something that is that, that ought to be eminently fixable because there is no reason science has to be this way, that there have to be these tremendous pressures on scientists to constantly pre- be producing results, um, constantly be chasing after the, you know, what so- sometimes seems like the diminishing pools of funding. Um, there must be better ways of doing things than this, but we haven't yet found them. And I think that's really one of the things that the scientific community as a whole has to address. How can we reverse these unrealistic pressures to produce in science? When it comes to policy, do you think current scientists are too safety conscious? I wouldn't say they are actually. Um, in in well, in policy now that de- really depends what you mean. I mean, there are, for example, you know, we can raise this question during the pandemic: was there too much uh, caution with things like the testing of vaccines or the you know the various measures that were introduced? And of course, that is a question that became hugely politicised. Um, from what I saw, I think that it absolutely wasn't the case with the vaccines. I think that the the balance was was exactly right there, that they were properly tested while still being um, accelerated um, to a degree that, you know, we absolutely needed. And that was really a question of money more than anything else. There was so much money thrown at the problem that it was possible to do things all at once that normally would have been done in succession, that the drug companies could afford to take those those risks um, with, with because they they, they have the, the the financial backing, so I think in terms of things like that, in terms of the safety of pharmaceuticals, I think that at the moment I, at the moment I see no no cause for concern. There have been worries about whether scientists have been too cautious. Um, in coming for in in in, uh, in their views about climate change, so that you know some people say surely we knew twenty or thirty years ago that this was already a huge problem. Why weren't scientists making much more noise about it then as they are now when things are getting to a really desperate stage? And that was a process that I really saw unfold as an editor of Nature. We were handling a, a lot of the the top climate papers, you know, at that time when the the the, the worries of uh, climate change were starting starting to be raised. And I saw scientists going through an incredibly careful and cautious process of not wanting to be alarmist, not wanting to claim more than the data allowed, uh, allowed them to say with confidence. And it felt to me as though that was right. It felt to me as though that is why today we can say with such confidence that climate change is real and that we know something about the causes and that it seemed clear that, that, that you know, they're primarily anthropological anthropogenic because there was that very cautious, very careful checking out of the grounds for saying that during those years. 
it may well be the case that because of that caution, the alarm wasn't raised soon enough, and it's very hard to know, you know, how to manage that um, uh, that 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 discrepancy. Um, but I I do feel that now we can be very confident in the uh, the conclusions that have been reached, and so it's absolutely right that that scientists, climate scientists in particular, are really making strong statements and raising the alarm about what the future holds in 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 this regard. So I don't think that there's too much caution there. How far away are we from having artificial wombs that work? <laughs> yeah, well, this has been certainly a question for the part. Well, it's actually been a question for almost 100 years now. This was something that um, uh, some scientists were deba debating in the 1920s and 1930s. In fact, it was that debate that led to um, uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which essentially talks about this sort of in vitro gestation of, of whole populations. So, you know, that question has been around and that research has been around for, for at least 100 years years now. We're getting closer. It's it's an incredibly slow process. Um, and we're, we're kind of coming at it from two, both directions now. So there are technologies, there, there, there are uh, techniques now that are being used to keep alive babies that, who are born very, very prematurely that would previously have died. Um, and then from the other direction, it's becoming possible to grow embryos for longer and longer periods um, outside the womb. This isn't done with human embryos because in just about all countries, that's forbidden for longer than 14 days. But with um, with animal embryos, uh, that it, it, it's clear that they can be grown for much longer than that, um, almost to the point of, of full gestation, actually, certainly up until about sort of halfway through where you've, you've really got something like a fetus. So we have the technologies that are, that are getting there from these two directions. I think the broader question is do we why would we need a technology like that to do the whole job uh, certainly for humans it's not clear that we we that there's a, a call for it it's not clear that there's any real social driver for that sort of technology having there, there is a big fertility crisis right oh there absolutely well there, there well, is the for various for it, reasons right? we need well, more people in in the future at some point well, I, <laughs> if we need more, more more people in future, I don't think. I mean, I think this is one of those problems, like many problems, that is a, a a social and economic problem that is not going to be solved by technology. Um, so you know, the idea that if if uh, and it's it's questionable if this really is the case, but if there if there is the case of declining fertility, um, it's not at all obvious that the reasons that 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 what we therefore need is more children made by artificial means, not only because we have no means of doing that at the moment, not only because we don't understand the, all of the, uh, the eth ethical and, uh, 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 and uh, safety issues associated with a potential technology like that, um, but also because it, 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 if there is a decline in fertility, in fertility rates in the n number of children being born in some countries, that isn't because it's impossible. That is because of uh, of of social changes that are the things that we need to be looking at to if you know if we're concerned about a problem like that. I mean, it's not clear to me that it actually is a problem at the moment. You know, the problem of population growth is 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 the problem that we still face. So I'm not sure that we're going to see artificial wombs uh, developed. Um, in the in the near future for human reproduction, because I don't think that there's a, a clear need for them. But isn't that a case of scientists, maybe yourself included, being too cautious? So you understand asymptotes. A smaller population would be fine five years from now. But if we just keep on shrinking, it seems virtually every country except Israel uh, and parts of Africa have gone below replacement rates, right? often considerably below. South Korea is at 0 0.7. Uh, we can't just have things shrink, shrink, shrink. I mean, the ethical and danger implications of that are quite extreme, especially for countries with debt or a lot of retirees. 
Well, I think one of the, as you say, one of the issues that that raises is more about the demographic, the change in demographic where you have an increasingly aging population. Um, and, you know, that's also because we're living longer in, in a lot of countries. And uh, so that that certainly needs to be talked about. And we need to think about what the answer to that is. I'm not sure that the answer to that is simply to to, to have more, more children. It's been predicted by, I mean, I'm no expert in, in demographics, but it's been predicted by demographers for for a long time that actually we we are we were going to go and are going to go through a, a population hump that we're going to it's going to peak at maybe something like 9 billion or so and then it's predicted to decrease to something more like perhaps 6 billion or something which i think would be a fantastic thing because you know it it, it that that is one of the one of the big challenges that we have been facing is the growth in in population the demands that that creates for food production for energy for economic growth generally so i i i don't see um any reason to uh to believe that a you know, a decline from that, if we reach that figure of 9 billion, that a decline from that um, is going to be inherently bad in in itself. And I certainly don't think that at this point, there is any reason for anyone to fear that somehow the population is going to, you know, shrink to to nothing. I don't think anyone feels that's the case. But I but I do feel that, as I say, it's if there are concerns of that sort to be raised, then what we need to be asking is what is behind the um this this decline in in you know in in fertility um it's not in it's not fertility in the technical sense it's not infertility there are issues there uh to some degree but that doesn't seem to be causing the 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 uh decline in birth rate it seems to be the choices that people are making so why are they making that, those choices that's what we really need to understand but it could simply be for a lot of people kids aren't that fun And we're just on that asymptote forever, because that won't change. Many other things have become more fun, like the internet or playing with AI. Kids have become a bit more fun. Maybe it's safer to raise them, but the basic joys are more or less constant. So then we're stuck again. Well... uh in my experience, kids are a lot of fun. Um, uh, but I think it's really important that, you know, not everyone is made to feel as though they ought to feel that way. Um, so absolutely, I think if people choose uh, to 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 not to have children, then, you know, I think that that should be, I, uh, th- there's there's often a problem, actually, that that um, if people make that choice, it becomes stigmatized. You know, it's, it's, it becomes, what is your problem with children? And I absolutely, you know, I think that's a terrible sort of attitude to take. I think it absolutely has to be a a matter of personal choice. I think for some people also, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why this seems to be happening. Um, You know, for for some people, it may be an economic one. Uh, Kids cost a lot of money. um, And, uh, you know, not everyone can can, can afford that. But it's the richer societies where birth rates fall, right? In Niger, you have seven kids to a family. The yeah, Nordics, yeah. which have free childcare, all sorts of benefits from others. I mean, they're, you know, often between one and 1.5 and they do many things right. They're very nice places, pretty easy to raise kids there and they're going to disappear. I don't know that they're going to disappear. I think it would be it, it, it's important to understand why it is that those trends are happening, um, and to have some sorts of projections of how they might ultimately uh, play out. My understanding is certainly that in some Asian countries where birth rates are falling, it's and I think this may be true actually in some African countries as well. It, it seems to be there seems to be some connection to the increasing empowerment of women, which you know has to be a good and important thing and particularly in some asian countries um w- women are increasingly realize uh, increasingly thinking you know why should i follow the traditional route of uh you know getting married young raising a family rather than having a a career and also as as uh the, the women in those countries get greater access to education um 
they become a bit more discerning about, you know, what they're going to to uh, accept and what they're going to look for in a partner and, and what they're not. And I think that, too, has to be a good thing. Um, and I think that, you know, if that's the case, if women are finding actually, you know what, I would uh, rather not, you know, start a family young, get married young. I would rather actually have a career. I would rather um, have my own independence. Um I, I, it seems to me that not only is that a, is that a, a positive thing in itself, but that is something we need to we need to understand. Well, why is it so? Um, why do women have to? You know, why are they faced with making that choice? Why are they faced with the choice of either a, a, a career or you know a conventional uh, family life? Um, so I, I think that the, again, these seem to me to be. Quite social questions that we need to ask that don't have and shouldn't have a technological solution. Why isn't the human body more symmetric? So my heart's on my left side, right? Uh, yeah, it's pretty symmetric. Um, it's, you know, we do have this bilateral symmetry, but it's not perfectly uh, so. And the question, the, yeah, the question of, of, of why that is so, why would we have these small asymmetries I'm not sure, I may be wrong, but I'm not sure that that's um, something to which we have a, a clear answer. Uh, you know, it may be, I mean, we, we have some understanding now, and it's a really interesting understanding of how developmentally that happens, how that symmetry is broken in the body. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's really fascinating to see how that happens. And, in, and when you start to think about it, it's not obvious why it should happen at all. If we start from this symmetrical bundle of cells, um, why, you know, does, uh, how does that symmetry get broken in the first place to create any sort of structure? Um, so we have some understanding of, of how it happens developmentally. But whether there's uh, a, an adaptive benefit or a physiological benefit to these small asymmetries that appear certainly internally in the body, I'm really not sure. Um, you know, it may just in some cases be an evolutionary accident. Now, you've written a book on invisibility. After I read your book, I was wondering, how much would it be worth today to be, you know, Wells is the invisible man? Say you're an able-bodied 30-year-old man in the United States or in the U.K., and you could turn invisible at will and then be seen again. And let, let, they don't capture you or imprison you to be studied for science. How much is that worth? <laughs> you can well, go around and steal things or yeah. see people naked or what? what is it? What's the equilibrium? Yeah, exactly. And Tyler, it's so interesting that those are the two things you, you know, alight on us. Hey, you could do those things because that really is the message of H.G. Uh, Wells' book. And it's a message that he took from an ancient myth that you first crops up in Plato's Republic, um, a myth of, uh, of, of uh, a chap called Gyges, who is a shepherd who finds a ring of invisibility. So he's, you know, um, he's just going about his job as a shepherd and then he comes across this ring. And uh, what does he do? He, uh, the first thing he does is he gets to go on the, um, the, the sort of um, expedition of, of ta I guess it's sort of taking the tax or something to the king and uses the ring to kill the king, seduce the queen and become a, the ruler, a tyrant, in fact, of the population. And the, 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 the message that Plato wanted us to, to get from that story and that H.G. Wells wanted us to get when he rewrote it as the Invisible Man is invisibility corrupts. That um, I mean, and invisibility there is a kind of metaphor for lack of responsibility. When you can evade responsibility for your actions, which is exactly what you know you're talking about. We could do if we had this ring of invisibility. That is a corrupting uh, capability to have, and it it seems almost inevitable that that is what happens. And in fact, it's what we see happening all the time now, particularly on the internet, where that anonymity, effectively that invisibility that the internet provides, that social media can provide to some people, or they think it provides anyway, um, we see that, that that encourages them to do things and to say things that they would never do to someone in person. Um, and sometimes this is even called the Gyges effect. So the, these stories that we, we have told traditionally about invisibility seem to have this kind of uh, this moral conclusion 
that actually invisibility, it sounds like it would be a wonderful superpower, but we have to really uh, be, beware of that that temptation because it's it's a very strong corrupting influence. I mean, look, it's that's of course that's what happened in the Lord of the Rings, right? Um, that was the uh, entirely the metaphor of the the you know the ring of power there. So I would say, I mean, you know, in military terms, invisibility would probably be be worth enormous amounts, and the military in particular is invest in research that is, you know, pr- that is trying to, to find materials and so forth that can confer some degree of invisibility, whether it's to radar or to infrared or whatever. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I, 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 I think the message from history and from mythology is that invisibility is a power to be very wary of. And do you think you could turn it into a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars or how much? I think you could name your price if you had a technology that... No, no, uh, only you. You're invisible. No one else can do it. (laughs) You can lift wallets from people's pockets, whatever you want. You see, uh, having having written that book and having looked into the history of it, I would like to feel that if someone said came along and said, here's a ring of invisibility, it's all yours and just yours. Do what you want with it. I would like to think that I would be like Gandalf and I would say, no, take it away. Don't tempt me with it because I, I know where that stuff leads. Um, so, you know, if 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 one had it, then of course, the, you know, the sky's the limit. You could take what you liked um and that that's the worry so uh yeah for me i would say i would love to feel that i would resist that temptation why is it that we as evolved humans find outer space beautiful is that a coincidence or is there a reason why it worked out that way well, we find it, I mean, I, I certainly find it beautiful. I find it beautiful to, to see it from Earth. Actually, I find space itself, the thought of space itself, terrifying. And I feel that's really how we should see it. Um, and in the, you know, this era of, of, of space travel, I think um, we're seeing that that's the case. I mean, I, I was really struck by how when uh, William Shatner was taken by uh, Jeff Bezos on his one of these flights on the uh, is it called Blue Origin the flight the you know the yes um, so he took uh, Shatner up there Shatner of course being being Captain Kirk of Star Trek and um, Sh- and, and Shatner came came back and and said he he found he felt this profound f- emptiness really loneliness terrifying loneliness he 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 felt that he was looking at death when he looked out into space which is absolutely not, not what you expect to hear from from captain kirk right um and i think that's right i think that's the right way to see it space uh, it, it, you know in reality when we're out there when people are out there it's constantly trying to kill us in all sorts of ways with with radiation you know obviously it's it's incredibly cold it's a vacuum um so it's a deathly place so I think that that space looks beautiful to us from Earth, from this place of safety. And it's it's because it's a place of safety that actually I think space reminds us of how precious, or should remind us, of how precious this place is. This place where we have the privilege of being able to look out onto the stars from somewhere that gives us everything we need. And, you know, from that perspective... It it is it is awe inspiring and you know I, that's that's really I mean I, I guess I feel when I when I you know look out on a night like that when I'm away from London away from the light pollution um, that what I feel is awe in the old sense in the 19th century um, sense of the sublime this sort of slightly terrified um, awe of you know what what is out there of of our I wouldn't say our insignificance but our small part in something that is just so vast um you know when you really think about what all these pinpricks of light represent you know some of them being certainly if you look through a telescope some of them being entire galaxies um and we have no idea we really have no idea how far that goes out to it is it it it's it, there's a beauty beauty to it but it's a terrifying beauty speaking of terrifying What's the hidden, or you could say Straussian reading, of the Chartres Cathedral in France? Ah, well, <laughs> there's, um, 
I, the way I presented it in, in, in my book, I called my book Universe of Stone. And the idea behind that title was that in some sense, the Gothic cathedrals and Chartres is it's certainly my favorite. And I think it's it's one of the, the earliest of the true Gothic cathedrals and one of the most beautiful and spectacular. In some sense, what they represented was a model of the universe, a kind of a kind of medieval cosmology, because at that time, and in fact, as it happened particularly in Chartres, in the Cathedral School of, of Chartres, there was a, a resurgence of interest in the philosophy, the philosophy of Plato. And Plato had this idea that the whole of the cosmos was built on principles of a sort of cosmic harmony that, that involved geometric ratios between things. And so the, the Gothic cathedrals themselves have, they, they, they are planned according to, um, ideal ratios, simple ratios of, you know, uh, height and, and width and so on of proportion, ratios of one to two and two to three. And that, um, that, that, uh, that that design and that that wish to sort of convey somehow this kind of sense of order and cosmic harmony that's i think what we respond to even today in in those places even though we of course we can't see them through medieval eyes and we're used to seeing now gigantic constructions of all sorts but nevertheless for me the the the, the gothic cathedrals still retain something that modern architecture hasn't managed to capture in the in the in the sense of conveying that kind of sense of harmony and 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 order uh so so that's absolutely what the the gothic cathedrals were, were aiming to do and the um you, you know we, we we know that the the people who were designing them the as we would now think of them as the architects were um were drawing on those platonic ideas of harmony and trying to express them explicitly in what they did so there's nothing um i mean this um you know this is it, it starts to sound like we're getting into dan brown territory here um and you know people have claimed and i think it's probably claimed in dan brown's novels that uh, there are all sorts of hidden codes and so on within the uh, the gothic cathedrals but i think actually the, the the real meaning is there in plain sight because we can see that they are built according to these principles of proportion that we know were important to the theologians and to the architects who worked for them. But it's harmony plus demons, right? Like I take the message of the cathedral to be demons rule even the heavens. You mean because they have these place gargoyles? To go. You know, it's like <laughs> Shatner in outer space. I'm in the cathedral. I, I'm thinking, my goodness, this is terrifying. You know that's exactly what Napoleon is said to have said um, when, uh, because you know Napoleon brought uh, so the Republic, you know the uh, the French Republic had had uh, was you know famously going to get rid of all this uh, religious uh, nonsense and it was going to be a uh, you know a, a kind of a built on on principles of reason, reason and, and 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 so on. Napoleon said that in the Gothic cathedrals, you know, even an atheist will feel kind of uncertain of themselves because of that, and I think that's that's quite right. Right. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I'm an atheist and I certainly had that feeling inside Charter. Um, and there is something, again, there is something about that sort of terrifying awe. Um, and, and, but I think there it's also a kind of an awe just at the sheer feat of engineering that, were, you know, that, that they represent that was done by, obviously, you know, by hand. I mean, with very sort of primitive uh, machinery for lifting and so on. But, you know, there, were, there was no mechanization there. And so the, the, the sheer fact that these places were built and that they are still standing, so many of them, after, you know, a thousand years, is, 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 is truly extraordinary. Um, and, and I think, I mean, you know, I thought you might be talking about the fact that you do also literally in some of these cathedrals have the, the demons around you, you have the, the gargoyles um, sort of up there looking down at you. Um, I, I think that to some extent, and we can see this in, in, in you know, what was actually depicted, to some extent, there's a playfulness there that I think people have always had, that the stonemasons had. There's a delight that they had in creating these grotesque and, you know, often quite playful uh, uh, carvings high up there, you know, sort of out of sight, perhaps, of the uh, of the priests uh, where they, you know, they were free to let their imagination uh, have free reign. Why is so much late medieval culture, science, you could say music, tapestry work, 
concentrated in northern France. What what was special about that region at the time? Um, at the, the 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 early Gothic era certainly did uh, uh, start a, in in northern France. So it's it's uh, this region called the Ile de France. Um, so it's the region. I suppose it's within. I can't remember quite uh, what what distance it's typically said to be, but I think within about fifty mile radius of of Paris. And um, that that was it was absolutely that was a centre of of learning at that time. Um, Britain, I have to say, England was very much. Uh, an intellectual backwater at that time. Um, so France was was certainly one of the regions where there was this resurgence of learning. There was some of it happening in Germany as well, but France was a more unified country and it um, had been so to some extent ever since the Emperor Charlemagne um, in, the, uh, um, in, in, in the ninth century. Um, so it, it had had this stability and Charlemagne, in fact, himself was uh, famously wanted to sort of bring about a sort of resurgence of learning it only really kicked off um in the in in the around the the 11th century 11th 12th centuries are often called the the medieval renaissance but i have to say that a lot of that learning was imported uh, was brought from the um islamic countries from from uh spain which was uh you know occupied by what were then uh, called the moors and be- because you know, in the centuries preceding that era, that was the the era of the golden age of learning in the in in the uh, Islamic nations, and um, they, the Islamic scholars, translated a lot of the the works of the ancient Greeks, Aristotle and Plato, and many others, um, into Arabic. And the European scholars, many of them from France, but also from Germany and from uh, from from Britain, were coming down to Spain to get hold of those works and to translate them, to learn Arabic and to translate them from Arabic to Latin. And so that was really what created this influx of uh, of, of uh, learning into Western Europe at that time. It was coming from translations of Arabic works. If we think of the 17th century scientific revolution in England, putting aside the longer term role of the church in preserving manuscripts and the like, but do you view Christianity as being a net positive or net negative behind that development? I guess I feel, that in a way, that's a, a question that um, it, it's it's hard to see what the uh, what what the uh, counterfactuals would be to that because you know history is history, right? So um, I, it, it, to, to all of the scientists um, in the certainly in the in the seventeenth century, the time that's often called the, the scientific revolution. Um, Christianity was was just a given. The you know the fact that uh, that that God existed, you know, no one really at that time questioned that. They had different ways of understanding that and of expressing that. But for 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 those scholars, um, you know, that was just a given, and so that informed everything that they were doing. So it for some people, um, p- for example, the the Anglo Irish. Um, uh, scientist, as we now see him, Robert Boyle in the 17th century, um, it was a, it was a, uh, a Christian mission to try to find out all that we could about God's creation, about this world that God had created. That was a duty, a Christian duty, to to be curious, to be interested in in everything in nature. And Boyle would make these long lists, this sort of random list of things he wanted to find out about, things he wanted to sco- to discover. It was really the 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 first golden age of curiosity that time. And I think that's, uh, to my mind, that's a better way of looking at it than calling it the scientific. Revolution. It was the age when curiosity was kind of liberated. So there was in in earlier times, in medieval times, there was often a sense expressed um, by some theologians that curiosity was something to be at best cautious of, and at worst very suspicious of, or even condemning of, because they saw it as a prying into things that it was not humankind's um, preserve to ask about. Um, whereas, uh, you know, in in the by the seventeenth century. Um, really through the process of the Renaissance and the humanism and the resurgence of learning, um, it had become, it became acceptable to have this almost universal curiosity 
about the world. And that's absolutely something that we see in people like Boyle and Newton and the um, the fellows of the Royal Society in, in, um, in London, but also of other scientific uh, societies that started elsewhere in Europe. Um, and uh, as I say, underpinning all of that was a profound religious faith. And sometimes that was so sometimes that was, um, you know, a, a motivation for that curiosity. And sometimes it was in the case of, of Isaac Newton, for example, it was um, that was the framework within which he was developing his theory of gravitation. The question with uh, the, the, the picture that he presented of um, the, the planet's you know, revolving around the sun and the moon revolving around the earth because of uh, gravitational force being held there by gravity. That was all very well. But the question was, well, how did that get started? How, you know, what got them moving in the first place? We understand now that once they are moving, they'll continue to do so. For Newton, that wasn't really a question at all, because, of course, God did it. It was it was God's creation and, and it gave a coherence, really, to the picture that he was he was looking for. So I, I, I don't think that um, I mean, you can certainly find, um, of, of course, the obvious uh, counterexample is is the persecution of Galileo, which is often uh, sort of misrepresented. Galileo was, to some extent, the architect of his own misfortune, which is in no way to excuse the kind of treatment that he got from the Catholic Church. Um, so there were absolutely there were tensions between this this new understanding, this new way of thinking about the world, and the old idea the the old idea, according to some, that you know you shouldn't ask too much, or that it was well, it was just God that that, that did it all. There were tensions there, but I don't know that we need sort of see that. That as a you know a, a, a put put it as 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 weighing in the balance the pros and the cons it was simply how history was it was simply how ideas evolved um so yeah i i kind of you know for most of the history of science religion has been there as the backdrop whether it's islam or whether it's uh, christianity or whether it's judaism it's been there and science developed um so, you know, I think this idea that there was somehow a big tension between science and religion, in many ways, it's a modern construct. It's something that really only started to become emphasized in the late 19th century for various reasons, for various polemical reasons. I don't think it's something that we can uh, really see throughout his the history of science. Now, you've written a book about myths. Do you think there are myths from the last 10 or 20 years that will stick? Say the way Robin Crusoe is still around as a story, or Sherlock Holmes is still around. What would those myths be? Or have yeah. we stopped producing them? No, I, I'm sure we haven't stopped producing them. So my book about myths was actually about what I call the modern myths. And it's exactly those the, those uh, stories. So I begin with the earliest one that I look at from early modern times is Robinson Crusoe. And I bring it right through. And, and I, you know, I think... Um, it it wasn't it wasn't difficult to identify the 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 cat the candidates for that sort of status so they were things like frankenstein dracula jekyll and hyde sherlock holmes and the latest myth i look at in that book is batman um uh so you know that's 100 years old now actually it's amazing to think that that's the case but it virtually is um and uh, I, 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 and i don't think there's any reason to believe that we have stopped this process of inventing modern myths. Uh, but I, th I feel that it probably takes at least 50 years before some new narrative clearly acquires that sort of mythic status. And I think that one of them that is now emerging that has is the zombie myth. And, um, you know, we've, we've, I mean, the idea of zombies is, is, is an old one. It started to become popularized in sort of Western culture in the 1930s. Um, but I think it was really crystallized in the, uh, in the, the sort of horror movie, the, you know, the B movie horror films of the 1960s, particularly the George Romero films. So I think that we now all have a sense that you know the the zombie myth is something about the the zombie apocalypse um and you know so it's it's not individual zombies it's the we're being you know the humanity is overrun by uh by a horde of of mindless zombies and that's you know so that's that's the sort of basis of the myth we sort of have that now and i think that we're going to continue i think it's inevitable that we're going to continue to develop myths because what i argue in that book is that we have 
these these narratives acquire mythic status because they satisfy some need in us to explore anxieties social anxieties in stories in a way that allows us to look at them and explore them and think about them. Myths are tools for thinking with. They don't have a moral. They don't have a a clear conclusion. They allow us to to explore those anxieties. And there will always, sadly, there will always be new anxieties that are raised. We are starting to see a myth. We already have, to some extent, a mythology of AI. That's absolutely going to be a nexus around which certain mythologies are going to start growing. And that's, you know, that's because it's a new technology. It's an old idea. But now that it's becoming a reality, those anxieties are really, really, you know, uh, strong and with us and, uh, and, and prevalent. And so we're going to need myths to explore them. Um, w- one thing I, I sort of feel about that is that there are pros and cons to that because, you know, the myth that we have around AI, and it's one that's being fed at the moment, sometimes by tech companies even, is the of the AI apocalypse, the AI takeover that we, you know, suddenly AI becomes super intelligent and it has no need for us and it wipes out humanity. That, I think, is a very convenient myth for AI companies because it's something that's sort of out there in the indefinite future and they can say, oh, sure, we're worrying about that and we're taking care of that. Whereas the the real dangers and risks and things to be worried about with AI are much more mundane, mundane things that are here and now. You know, deep fakes, the production of misinformation, the mis the trivial but but sometimes important misuses of 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 AI because we attribute it too much power. Those are the things that we should really be be concerned about now. But uh, so, so you know, it could be that the myths that we develop kind of get in the way of the things we should really be worrying about in the here and now. Let's turn now to your new book again, How Life Works, A User's Guide to the New Biology, which I enjoyed very much and learned a great deal from. A simple question. Let's say an octopus loses an arm and then the arm can grow back. Sort of what exactly in the octopus knows to grow the arm back and where to have that growth stop? What's regulating this response? Because yeah. if I lose an arm, that doesn't grow back, right? I don't have that regulator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, a, an extremely active area of current research. My knowledge of uh, octopus anatomy is not sufficient to know whether octopuses can do that. I suspect they can't, but I may be wrong. But some creatures can, and certainly salamanders can, axolotls can. They can regrow uh, limbs that they have lost. So some creatures, some you know complex creatures, um, can uh, can do this. And we don't know exactly what enables them to do that, other than that. In order to do that, you have to, you will have to have a um, a reserve of something like stem cells, something that maintains a kind of stem cell-like state, like the cells that we grew from in the early embryo. Those are stem cells, the st- cells that in, in the, the early embryo, they're able to grow into any tissue type in the body. And we have, in, in our bodies, we have what are called adult stem cells, which can um, produce a limited number of tissue types. So we have them, for example, in our bone marrow, they, they, they continually produce uh, the different types of cells in our blood. Blood, um, but they can't, you know, produce muscle cells or, you know, um, brain cells or something. Um, whereas, you know, in, in creatures that can regenerate their limbs, they seem to have a kind of stem cell that can regrow into, you know, many different, t- into all the tissue types that that limb requires. The question of how that is done in a body that is already grown rather than an embryo where everything is growing and communicating and, and you know, um, sort of finding its way together. That is a profound one that I think we don't yet fully know the answer to. Um, and, you know, it's, a re- it's an area of intense research at the moment, not least because it raises that prospect of regenerative medicine, perhaps even in humans. If we understood how that is possible in a complex creature like an axolotl, might it not be possible to develop some kind of capability like that? in humans. And we don't know the answer to that, but it's not obviously uh, the case that we couldn't. Arguably, the axolotl cells are doing computational work. Is that one way to put it? uh, That could be one way to put it. Um, 
it, 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 it's uh, it, certainly it's uh, it's got to be a sort of collaborative process that the cells will have to be communicating with each other and communicating with other cells in at least some part of the rest of the body, um, you know, in order to figure out literally where they are and what they have to become as a result of that. Um, so that is a kind of computation of, you know, one cell communicating with those around it and, 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 and so forth. So that could be one way of, of thinking about it. But we don't know the, the language, really, of that computation, other than that we, we know that cells communicate with one another um, in various ways. They can exchange chemical signals just as they do in our synapses, um, uh, in, 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 our, um, in our brains. Um, they can exchange mechanical signals so that if you tug on the membrane of a cell, that can induce some, the cell to do something or to grow or develop in a certain way that it wouldn't have done um, otherwise. And they also communicate electrically. Um, so not just neurons, um, but all cell types pretty much in, in the human body have the potential to communicate with one another um, to, 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 to sense um, the electric signals that other cells can produce and to respond to those. We, um, uh, so there are these very, we know the languages that cells use, but we don't really understand the kinds of conversations that they're having in a creature like an axolotl to produce, you know, a fully formed, fully developed replacement limb. Do you think that my cells are doing computational work in a way that, though I cannot regrow a limb, in some manner makes me smarter? There's this big, uh, uh, well, it's an argument, really. Sometimes it's a raging argument in neuroscience about whether we should think of the brain as a kind of computer, whether it's doing computation or not. And no one agrees uh, about this. So, uh, and I, I'm fairly agnostic on this, except that I have a feeling that, act that, that it's not necessarily the most useful way to think about what's going on during cognition, to think of it as being just like the kind of computation that's going on in the you know electronic circuits of of, of our laptops, um, but it's but you can see why that analogy is made because these the the our, our, the neurons in our brains and other cell types are wired into networks that are clearly sending electrical pulses to one another and triggering each other to do uh, to do likewise. So you know it looks very much like in some ways like the exchange of electrical pulses between transistors on silicon chips. Um, but there are there are differences um, in that process as well, um, uh, sometimes profound differences. And so it's really not clear at the moment whether there is any straightforward or even um, any uh, a translation at all between the kind of computation that is done by silicon circuits and the kind of cognitive processing that is being done by neurons. But you're an atheist. Doesn't it tautologically have to be computation? So no one ever said it had to be like a computer, like I have on my desk. But it's in some manner, you know, in the Turing sense, a computation. Well, that's that, that's the thing. It really depends on the, the, you know, the context you're talking about. I mean, there are people, there are physicists who say, well, in some sense, we can think of everything that happens in the universe as a kind of computation of, you know, particles interacting with one another and responding to one another. And certainly we can develop a, a quantum mechanical description of what's going on in terms of the exchange of bits of quantum information between particles. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, and, you know, if, if, if uh, we mean computation in that sense of, uh, you know, simply interactions between particles, then sure, I think, you know, that's at the most fundamental level, that seems to be what we're going to find. Um, but, you know, whether that means we can usefully th use computational concepts uh, to try to understand uh, brain circuitry is another matter entirely. I mean, we, we you know, t talk in some ways, we talk about them in, in similar terms. We talk about, you know, memory and data storage and so on. And I think there are absolutely analogies to be had there. But whether there are, whether there are strict 
formal parallels between those two processes, I think, is something that is it's it's yet to be decided. And perhaps more importantly, it's yet to be decided whether that will be a useful way to think about those two processes, whether it will, whether it will help uh, neuroscientists formulate theories and understanding of how the brain works. I think that's still an open question. Tell us why you reject Richard Dawkins' vision of the selfish gene, as his book was titled. <laughs> okay. I think it's actually not quite as straightforward as rejecting it. You know, when I was writing my book, um, I wanted to I, I wanted to think, you know, clearly this has been a an a, a extremely productive uh metaphor and way of um portraying certainly what goes on in evolutionary biology. Um, so I don't think it would be fair or, or, or proper to, to simply say, well, that's nonsense. You know, it's time to get rid of that. So why, you know, what, in what way has it been useful? How to, how to, to, to put it in the right container, I suppose. And the, the way I, I saw it as this, I'm, I'm going to get, you know, set aside the, the question of selfishness, which I'll come back to in a minute, whether that's a good metaphor, but the idea that, um, that that we can essentially sort of reduce everything in biology to what the genes are doing that is a picture that is has been very productive to evolutionary geneticists to understand how um particular mutations of genes alleles, as they're called, different variations of a given gene, how they spread in a population. So if you get um, an allele arise, that um, a mutation of a gene that conveys some kind of um, property on the organism that gives it an adaptive advantage, an advantage you know, in competition with all the others, then that, uh, that allele is likely to spread because that organism will have more offspring and so on. And all of that is, you know, this is standard neo dull Indian theory, and all of that is is perfectly valid. So within that picture, a gene-centered view of that process of how alleles spread, um, it, you know, has been useful in that arena. The problem I have is when that comes to be seen as the the, the basis for understanding everything that life is. Um, because, you know, the problem with that is that there is no life in that picture. It's as simple as that. I think it's really interesting the, 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 what happens there, that um, the genes themselves in that picture are portrayed as little agents. And, you know, Richard Dawkins um, more or less explicitly does that. Of course, he's not saying they have any, you know, any purposes or any, um, any goals or intentions or any life, you know, in reality. But that is how they are portrayed, as though they are little organisms competing with one another, with, with you know, with goals, their goal being to, to replicate as much as possible. Even the fact that they can replicate, you know, they're portrayed as being able to replicate. No gene replicates. Um, genes are replicated. They are replicated within cells, by cells. Um, and that's an important distinction if we're going to think about, you know, how life works. But it may not be an important distinction to make in the context of evolutionary genetics. So that's really um, wh where I uh, want to sort of locate that picture of that sort of gene centric view that it's a, a particular model and the selfish gene metaphor is a metaphor for that particular model for for use within evolutionary genetics it does not speak about what genes are in a biochemical sense or what they are in a developmental sense and in fact I, I, it seems fairly clear that when we're talking about genes in terms of how an organism develops and you know what the role this particular bit of the DNA seems to to, to play in that development, that's a, 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 a rather different notion of a gene to this notion of the selfish gene, you know, in a pool of different alleles um, replicating. Um, the evolutionary gene and the developmental gene aren't necessarily the same thing, and so. Certainly, when we try to think about a gene in molecular terms, it's become very fuzzy, more and more fuzzy the more we've looked into what genomes really are, you know, what they really do and what, what, our, um, what our DNA does and what 
the, the different sequences of DNA do, we find that uh, what we think of as genes seem to overlap. There are some things that we call pseudogenes that maybe once were genes and aren't any longer, but maybe they can come back as genes. There are regions outside the, 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 the parts that we think of as genes that actually seem to have some important role in development. So the whole picture becomes very fuzzy. Um, so, and, and also within that picture, I think the question of selfishness is important because, you know, the selfishness refers to the tendency of a particular gene variant, an allele, to spread at the expense of other variants of that particular gene. That's very different from the notion of a set of genes in a genome working together to make an organism. They have to work together to make an organism. So they're not competing with each other. The gene that produces, um, you know, one enzyme isn't competing with a gene that produces, you know, some other enzyme. Um, they, they have to work together. So they're cooperative. So I think that that selfish metaphor isn't saying anything about what genes do biochemically. It's talking about that particular model. But say I want to defend the gene-centered view. It seems to me that CRISPR actually works. It's not counteracted by some complex set of macro interactions. If I look at genetically modified foods, corn, rice, and we apply genetic modification, it's quite predictable what will result, right? We're just not surprised mm -hmm. at what we get. Isn't that evidence that the gene-centered view, while maybe incomplete, in predictive terms, is really doing very well? Like, what would be a prediction your biological ecosystem view has in those cases that the gene centered view would not have i well i don't i don't sort of see it as a i mean this isn't some rival to that uh to that position this is an expression of what we have an, an attempt to to summarize what we have learned over the past 10 or 20 30 years since the human genome project really about the way uh, life really functions. And within that, it's absolutely beyond question that genes have a, a, a central role to play. Of course they do. They are, you know, that, they are the things that we, that we inherit from one generation to the next. And it's absolutely the case, as you say, that we can use now a gene editing technique like CRISPR, and we're getting better ones now, more accurate ones even. We can use that to address some diseases um, that are caused by a gene mutation. So it's being used, for example, to, uh, to, to, uh, cure sickle cell anemia, which comes about because of a gene, uh, a mutation to, to one particular gene. It's possible that it might be used for, for things like cystic fibrosis, for which that is also true. All of these uh, applications are for diseases that are in sickle cell anemia. Maybe this is less so, but most of them, uh, the, the, most of them are rare, and they are caused by the, the, they are traced back to, I should perhaps say, just one particular gene, or maybe you know, might be a couple of genes. They're monogenic. In those situations, we can edit that gene, um, whether in principle in the embryo or sometimes in the adult body as being done in, in sickle cell and uh, anemia. We can make that edit and we can have a predictable response on the whole, a predictable response um, uh, from that edit. So that's absolutely true because the, uh, the, the, the condition is being caused by a single gene. Most of the health conditions that concern you know, the, the developed world, uh, most, in fact, that concern the entire world, um, you know, heart conditions, um, obesity, diabetes, um, as well as most, as well as just about all the traits, the physical traits we have, you know, height and intelligence and so on, um, cannot be traced back to just one or two genes. They seem to be correlated with, so differences in, in, in different individuals seem to be correlated with differences in the genetic profile of many genes, sometimes hundreds, sometimes even thousands of genes. So, you know, a significant part of the, the of our total complement of genes. Um, so that's, um, you know, that that is what is what's become clear. And that is why it's not at all clear that th uh, techniques like CRISPR gene editing are going to be at all useful to address 
um, uh, uh, diseases like that. Not only because you'd have so many targets you'd have to try to hit and you're going to get some off target um, hits and, you know, that's going to uh, cause problems, but also because all of those genes, they're not just involved in that one thing. They're doing all kinds of tasks. They're doing many things. And so if you start changing them around, you don't know what else you're going to be producing, what other kind of phenotypic changes you're going to produce. And so what we need to understand is not to identify the genes and think we can address the problem there because or the you know the condition there because it's arising at some other level in the organism at a higher level at, in in somehow in the way all these genes are interacting with each other and with the other components of the genome and with the other components of the body perhaps in directing cells to do something different it's at a higher level that the real causation of a lot of these conditions arises and so it's there that we need to be thinking about intervening and that's really the 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 one of the messages that I'm wanting to try to get across in the book so it absolutely doesn't bring into question that idea that for some conditions we can identify specific genes that are in a real sense the cause of that that outcome but for most of the way life works for most of the things we're interested in in development and in medicine that's not going to do the job we have to have a higher level understanding of how that condition, how that trait is coming about. That's a more complex business that I'm trying to kind of tease apart in my book. I have some general questions about science for you. So I read Carl Friston with the free energy principle, the notion that it makes sense to understand systems as somehow minimizing the difference between the state of affairs prevailing at a moment and the goals of an organism. In psychology, this translates into some view of minimizing surprise. Things somehow happen so that what the agent expects and what happens, those two are brought together. I mean, are these useful ideas or are they just semantic reorganizations? Are scientists picking up on this? What's the status of all this work? Uh, so this is the um, the f- so-called free energy principle. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. That Carl Friston, um, uh, I guess it's Carl is a neuroscientist at, at UCL here, has been uh, a central proponent of. And I, I, I see different views on this. I think it's too early to say to what extent it will be useful. I find it a very, um, a very interesting idea. And a lot of neuroscientists are, fi- are looking into ways in which they might be able to use this idea to formulate and maybe even to answer questions. Um, and, you know, it is something that can be formalized. There is a, a, a mathematical theory behind it. Um, but others have said, and I think this is a this is a common um, complaint I might have about um, these kind of, <laughs> in some ways, they tend to be sort of theories of, of everything or, you know, theories of a very big thing, at least. Sometimes in order to be so, they become so abstract, so mathematically abstract, that it becomes very hard to see how you relate the ideas, which are interesting and maybe even productive in themselves, but how to relate them to the, you know, the lab work that a biologist, that a neuroscientist scientist is doing? How does it relate to what they're actually finding out? How does it help them to pose new questions and to construct and devise new experiments? And so, you know, I think at the moment it feels to me as though it's at the stage of an a, 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 quite an abstract idea that people are trying to find ways of turning into something more concrete to address a specific problem, whether it's in, um, uh, in, in, in neuroscience or elsewhere, or maybe even computer science. Um, to to you know to see whether it's going to be useful, but I but but I you know I applaud the uh, the, the fact that we we are we we have theories like this that are very general theories that are trying to understand something like in this case, um, Carl thinks that it's uh, it, 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 in some sense it can be considered a, th- a generalized theory of agency, and whether or not that's true, I think that a generalized theory of agency is absolutely something that uh, that science needs. I have a number of friends who seem to be quite worried that they have too many microplastics in their testicles and in their bodies more generally. Is there serious evidence behind that worry? 
I well, I mean, whether I, I haven't followed the work or whether it, whether they're accumulating in the testicles, it would be certainly concerning if that was the case. And there has been, you know, discussions about whether plastic pollution has some kind of role in what we seem to see as a declining as a decline in in sper- male in sperm count in male fertility, but but. In the more general sense, microplastics are absolute. There's there's clear evidence that it's a problem. That you see them everywhere. You see them, you know, in the Antarctic. You see them in marine organisms. Um, uh, so it, it it's very clear that that you know they're now a global pollution problem and one. But what's the very- harm to me as a body? I, I don't think we know yet. Actually, I mean, you know, I I I think that's that that's the problem. That it's you know, it's maybe still too early to know um, to what extent that's going to be a problem. I mean, I can't help feeling that any uh, a, any substance that doesn't break down, that simply accumulates in the body in this way, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a, a you know something that you want to have happening in your bodies and in your tissues. It's also um, it's, you know sometimes um, suggested that some of the additives, the plasticizers that are added to plastics like this, can uh, function a little bit. They look chemically or a little bit like um, certain hormones, and they, so they can mimic hormones and induce hormonal changes in the body. And there's a lot of research going to that at the moment that I'm absolutely not an expert in. But uh, that's one of the concerns that's being raised about them. Michael Webb put forward the hypothesis that progress in science has declined radically in percentage terms. And he points out in terms of the number of scientists, we have many, many, many more, not to mention more in China, more in India, more around the world. Yet overall rates of productivity growth, they're not higher. They're actually somewhat lower than, say, the 1960s. We now have many more women in science. So has there been this radical slowdown in the pace of actual discovery per scientist? Not in absolute terms, but per worker. Like our, our, our scientists today, per worker, just much worse. <laughs> just worse more more yeah good question there have been um some studies that have tried to quantify this and there have been suggestions that actually um transformational discoveries um seem to be slowing down more recently i mean that seems a bit of an odd thing to say in this age of you know we've talked about ai but also um biotechnologies some of the biotechnologies that are you know appearing today are so incredibly powerful and transformative um but uh i mean i i guess i i i'd say first of all that it's not entirely obvious that we can expect to see um advances in scientific understanding relating to productivity growth it depends what science we're doing you know certainly if we're trying to understand the topology of the universe say we can't expect to see much you know a return a commercial return from 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 that or certainly not directly but i think that what what i do see uh happening is that the increasing um, the expansion of science, really, that maybe it is in, to some extent a victim of its own success, that you see um, a, 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 a the institutionalization, the increasing institutionalization of science. I think sometimes um, it seems that it gives rise to a, a, a more conservative approach to things, a more cautious approach to things, so that it becomes harder for scientists who are working at a, 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 a what you might think as a, a, a more um, a high risk frontier of of research, it becomes harder for them to do that. It becomes harder for them to find funding. It becomes harder for them to get their papers uh, published because of this this, this increasing caution. There, so there's a sort of what. Statist- statisticians might say a regression to the mean. Everything becomes a little bit more mediocre and safe. And a lot of people in science complain that blue skies research, as they call it, research that is just saying, what if? What happens if? What would happen? Just curiosity driven research. That's becoming harder and harder to do because there's a, an increasing demand for short term commercial return on um on scientific research um and that you know perhaps gives rise to a greater timidity in what science is 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 being permitted so i think that 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 does seem to be a problem 
Um, you know, I think uh, it's it's hard to know what what to expect. I have to say because one could also argue, well, we t- we've got all the low hanging fruit, right? You know, all the sort of easier stuff to figure out about how the world works and about what things to make. We've kind of done that, um, and now we're on to the really hard stuff. Um, so you know, who, it's it's sort of diminishing returns. Now I don't know if that's true. I think that there are still immense questions that we haven't answered in science, but but it um, but they. The, the, you know, they seem to be incredibly hard ones. Questions like what is consciousness, which, you know, we don't even know if science will ever really answer that, or whether it's a philosophical question. Um, but but uh, but it's possible that part of that decline in science is because we're looking at more challenging problems now. Last set of questions is about you. What's your favorite science fiction book? Oh, that's a very nice question. I... Um, I don't read as much science fiction as I used to, but I used to be. I I read all of Philip K. Dick's books really in my in my younger years, and I think they were they they had that kind of mythic quality that I you know found in those older myths that I talked about. Um, and I also uh, devoured the works of of J. G. Ballard, which I it was very interesting to me how back in those days Ballard was just kind of dismissed as a genre writer, a science fiction writer, you know, and he never had any proper characters and so forth. And these days Ballard is seen as a total visionary, as he you know clearly is. He saw so much of what was coming back in the 1960s. So I, I would um, certainly name those two as as two of my favorite science fiction writers. Now, you do not have a traditional academic post and for a long time have not had one. If you meet a young writer who's very smart, great worker, and he or she wants to go into science writing, uh, what advice do you give? Or what is it they should know that maybe they don't know? Because you've done it. Yeah, well, I I guess I I did it back in the day when one could just kind of wander randomly into it as I did. Whereas these days it's much more professionalized, and I think that's bet that's very good that you can now you know take courses in science journalism and learn how to do things properly in a way that I had to learn on the job in a very sort of messy way. So you know I absolutely think that that would be something I would recommend get a training in science journalism um, because some of them are very good. They will equip you to to do what you want to do. I would say for anyone thinking about wanting to go into science book writing, it's really important that you aren't doing it so that you're going to become rich. Um, because, I mean, it's the same for any writer, actually. You know, this is not a way to become rich. You have to love what you're doing. You have to have a real passion for what you're doing. And I think certainly for, for book writing, um, it feels to me like you have to have something to say. It's, you're not, it's not enough there to just do a translation job of a difficult field. You want to, uh, uh, you, you really need to have something to bring to it, some insight to bring to it. So figure out what it is you want to say and figure out what kind of voice you want to say it in. And and the way to do that is to read, to read very widely and to find out what works for you, what sort of voice works for you. So as someone who's written about 30 science books, and most of them have more than one thing to say, like what trade is it in you that has given rise to you having so many things to say relative to so many of your peers? <laughs> well, I, What's the I, sauce in Philip Ball? <laughs> the secret I, sauce. I'd hesitate to put it that way when so many of my peers are do, do such a fantastic job. But I think, um, I, I think for me, what it is is um, that I have this extremely privileged position of being able to choose a topic and spend two, three, however many years really digging into it. And so it is, I've always felt given that opportunity, I'm, you know, I've got, I really want to make the best use of it that I can. And so I want to continually be finding out about new topics to take that opportunity to discover something entirely new. So there are some writers, not just in science, who think, who decide this is going to be my area. Area. I'm going to become a specialist in this area. I'm going to become known for writing about this topic. That's fine, you know, if that's if you clearly want to do that. But for me, it's it's just such a wonderful opportunity to express my and you know give free rein to my curiosity to find out about these new topics. And 
they 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 pop up. They suggest themselves. With you know, I I would never have imagined myself you know way back when working for Nature, writing a book about Gothic cathedrals, that presented itself in one way or another. The more I started looking into it, the more I thought there's a story here, and it's a story that I haven't really seen told. A story about how the cathedrals were built in connection with an emerging new view of the cosmos, a new view of how the world worked in the Middle Ages. Um, so you know that's the kind of thing that I look for. I, I'm I'm waiting for um, the sort of penny to drop of aha. I can see something new in here. There's and and this is an area that I'm going to be enriched by spending two or three years finding out about. Before I pose my last question, just again your latest book, How Life Works: A User's Guide to the New Biology. Final query: What will you do next? Ah. Uh, now that that I have to keep under wraps. I, well, uh, the, I've I've just had a, uh, a book deal pretty much agreed, and I'm I'm going to keep that under wraps for now. But I can, what I can tell you is next next um that is the book that is going to come out later this year which i've already written um it's a it's a relatively short book because it's highly illustrated i've done one or two others um of this sort with the same uh publisher and it's an illustrated history of alchemy uh so that's what i've been writing since finishing how life works i've had a fantastic as i knew i would have had a fantastic time writing it and i know that because i've worked with these people before it is going to look absolutely gorgeous so an illustrated history of alchemy philip ball thank you very much thank you